Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to Coffee Chats with Experts. I hope everybody's doing well. Well, the topic of today's discussion is around droplet digital PCR. And if you have already listened into one of our other coffee chats, you may recognize a few of the panelists who were so great last time, we just had to invite them back. <laughs> <laughs> so without any further ado, I'm your host, Laura Moriarty, and let me introduce our three experts this morning. So first up, we have Tara. Hey, Tara. Hi there. So she's joining us from the East Coast this morning. So great to have you again. And as everybody knows who's listened to the previous coffee chat, she is extremely qualified to be on this panel because she has used qPCR extensively as part of a postdoc. She has produced viral vectors for in vivo studies. She has since 2013 been teaching DDPCR as well as qPCR as a field application scientist here at Biorad. And since 2016, she has been the U.S. application lead for Droplet Digital PCR. So welcome. Happy to be here. Yay. So next up, we have Matt. Morning, Matt. Good morning, Laura. Morning. And hopefully everyone recognizes Matt from the previous Coffee Chats too. So Matt is a biochemist and structural biologist by training, and he has actually been using PCR for molecular cloning of multiple pro target proteins. Um, for example, in neuronal signaling networks for the verification and checking of mutations via qPCR. And he is well known in the field here in the US because he supports and trains multiple teams working on viral vector R&D and manufacturing and specifically helping folks around viral titer optimization and other best practices for droplet digital PCR. So welcome, Matt. Thank you for having me today. Awesome. And last but not least, a newbie to our panel. Morning, Diana. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. So we're so pleased to have Diana join us. Diana has a lot of experience in microbiology, immunology, um, molecular genetics, and she has a PhD from UCLA. And she has um, lab experience in virology, cancer cell biology, PCR assay design, and she has been working developing assays and applications for the Droplet Digital PCR team for over seven years. And currently she heads up the applications group down there in Pleasanton, um, just in the South Bay over here in California for the digital biology group. So we're really excited to have Diana join us this morning. Welcome, Diana. Thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here. Oh, yay. All right. So, so as always, we love to get your questions. So lovely audience members, please type those into the Q&A. We'll get those over to our panelists and let's see if we can keep them on their toes this morning with some super <laughs> hard questions. Ha, 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 ha. <laughs> um, <clears throat> they're going to be kicking me under the virtual table for that yeah. one later. <laughs> All right, but don't worry if you're listening on demand, you can still ask hard questions, but you will get an answer via email as opposed to in yeah. person. All right, is everybody ready? Ready to I'm go. Ready. All right, thumbs up, love ready. it. <laughs> so here is a common question that I have heard throughout the years um, from my time uh, helping folks over here in Biorad. So, my qPCR data doesn't match my droplet digital PCR data. So what do I do? <laughs> Who would like to kick us off? Matt. Yeah, I'll take that one. And, and it's very common. And, and of course, we realize when we are training folks in the field on droplet digital PCR, in most cases, the transition that they're making is from qPCR. Um, and that's just because what we've historically been trained on since we were in graduate school and even undergraduate. Um, when looking at DDPCR data and trying to do comparability to qPCR, in most cases, it's a pretty easy transition. You, and I'd say probably 95% of the time, you can just take that assay that you ran on qPCR and perform really two optimizations, uh, concentration, so making sure you're within the dynamic range of DDPCR, as well as optimizing the annealing temperature. 
Um, and so, of course, when we're comparing two different technologies, it can happen that the values we see are not the same. But you have to realize that with DDPCR, we're talking about absolute counts of targets versus qPCR. We have to relate to a standard. And so you have to ask the question, what is the error when quantifying of that standard that we initially acquired? And then, of course, what is the error bars with qPCR? And so typically that just requires some type of correction factor from moving between the two. Um, platforms. Brilliant. Anybody want to add? Great warm up there, Matt. <laughs> I just want to add QPCR and undergraduate. You're making me feel old. <laughs> <laughs> Back in the days, those dark ages. Brilliant. All right. So I am going to ask one more question and then we'll get it over to the audience questions. So here's another one. Can you use droplet digital PCR for single cell applications? And if so, which applications? Yeah, I can take that one. All right. Um, so it's a natural question to ask, and it's one that I've gotten for a pretty long time now. So of course, with digital PCR, it's nucleic acid counting technology, but where do those nucleic acids come from? They come from the cell. And um, you know, first of all, the first I heard of um, single cell applications was in gene expression. You know, so it's not exactly single cell in that a cell goes into a droplet, but it's one step away from that where we just make some cDNA from cells and put that cDNA into the droplets and count up how many transcripts there are in every cell. And that's super cool and um, the best way I can think of to do it. But um, there are more recent applications. You know, so for example, going literally into the cell applications. Last year, Biorad um, Food Science Division released a DD check stack kit where we look for co-localization of virulence factors in E. coli. So testing your the bacteria in your meat before you eat it, pretty important thing to do. Uh, and then just this year, we're releasing a brand new whole cell DNA workflow where, for example, for CAR T cells, you can measure what percentage of those cells actually have the vector that you were trying to introduce to them. So brand new stuff, it's really cool. So could you just explain a little more about how the, I was gonna ask about the meat thing, but um, it's a bit early over here to be talking about meat, but could you just explain a little more <laughs> about the CAR T and the DDPCR, like how does that work? Sure, yeah, so with, uh, with CAR-T, um, basically you're taking T cells um, that you take them out of you know, a person, usually, <laughs> um, and they don't have the um, particular receptors that you want them to have um, in order to, um, to fight the cancer or whatever other disease. So basically you're introducing a novel vector that expresses the receptor in the cells that will, um, that will do the job that you want it to do. Um, but the thing is, is that transfection is never 100%. Sometimes it's an awful lot less than that. Um, and so in order to optimize this process upstream and even to do quality control downstream, you wanna know how many of the cells actually have the receptor that you want them to have. Um, so uh, DDPCR is a great way to do that. Um, basically, you can get an actual percentage of your cells that have that. Now, there's other um, there's other technologies that will let you do it. So, fly, flow cytometry, for example. Um, but there are some downsides to that. You know, so for example, you need a flow cytometer. <laughs> you need to know have somebody who knows how to use it and an antibody. Whereas DDPCR, you can just sidestep all of those things. Oh, that's brilliant! <laughs> all right. Yeah, oh, Diana, go I ahead. Yeah, sure. I can just um, add to that a little bit just to say that um, the whole cell DDPCR um, workflow that we just launched with a new reagent um, this last uh, month uh, is, you know, really, really robust and a quick way of doing things, especially if you don't have a lot of cells. Uh, with flow cytometry, you usually need a lot more cells than you do for uh, the DDPCR um, application. So just an additional benefit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's fantastic. I think that with these new therapies coming out, any uh, new technology or new assay is going to be so helpful to folks because it is so new, it is so cutting edge um, that maybe there isn't a lot of options. So it's great that um, we can support that. So 
Yay. Thanks. Everyone. Yeah, we're really excited about it. Yeah, and just to add, I think, you know, the real power of this is accessibility, right? So as Tara already mentioned, in previous in our previous world, you had to have a flow cytometer due to this kind of detection. And I get a lot of times, especially being based in California and working with biotech companies, um, real estate is precious. So the, the more uh, techniques that you can do on a single platform, it brings the value up within that lab. And so that is something that people are really... Um, investigating these days because you don't want to have a one trick pony sitting in your lab. You want to be able to do lots of things with it. Yeah. Also yeah. the training, right? Just the training of um, personnel. Once you've trained them to do DDPCR, the whole cell workflow is, is uh, fairly straightforward and as simple as doing a, a, you know, DNA assay. Yeah. Brilliant. Well, now I'm going to throw a really mean question at you or <laughs> <laughs> just to bring you down just a tad all right what evidence is there that ddpcr is accurate i love this question i love this question <laughs> I, I can take that okay. um we do actually get this question quite frequently and it's a really good one because um you know, with a lot of uh, te technologies prior to this one, um, there really wasn't much of an accuracy, uh, you know, claim. But we um, we do see that with the work that we've been doing with NMI and NIST and many other measurements institutes, that what they are discovering is that there is a great degree of accuracy, and they are creating um, an SI unit for the. Uh, uh, genomics so that you can have a traceable, so a, an SI traceable uh, genomic measurement. And so it's not just us saying that DDPCR is accurate, but it's also the number of measurements institutes that we're working with. And there's many publications out already today. Okay, fine. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I was asking. It's not just us. I guess. <laughs> That's brilliant. Okay, good. Well, hopefully that answers um, that scientist's um, concerns there. Okay, so here's a really here's a really good one. Um, uh, let me just push it to you guys so you can see it. Um, how does DDPCR quantify without a standard curve? Because we're, we're talking about um, not having to use a standard curve. Um, how does it? What do they? Yeah. Can you help this person? <laughs> Diana? I can take okay. that. I can take that one. So, because we are physically partitioning the sample and then counting the number of um, physical molecules either present or not present, um, we don't need a standard curve. So, you don't need to compare it to anything. Now, that doesn't mean that you don't need a control. Controls are always the responsible thing to do. You always need positive and negative controls um, just to verify that your workflow and that your experiment worked and that your assay. Uh, was working, your thermal cycler was working, but you do not need to compare um, and get a relative measurement. You're actually getting a physical um, yes, no, present or absent answer. So you come out with an actual number of copies. Hmm. Got it. Okay. You give a big thumbs up to the controls. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> controls are good. <laughs> yes. Yeah, shout, shout out to the controls, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here we go. Uh, here comes another one. Oh, here's a good one. All right. Um, so this person's asking if they can use other vendors' assays with DDPCR. I want to say no, of course not, but um, <laughs> let's hear it. From... <laughs> go ahead. Oh, oh, Matt and Tara want this one. <laughs> go ahead, Tara. <laughs> Virtual arm wrestle. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, the, the short answer is yes. You know, so um, it is not a locked system by any means. It's not like you just have to pick whatever kit off the shelf and run with it. Um, uh, you can, you know, for example, if you have a qPCR assay that measures what you're interested in, chances are you can port that assay pretty much directly over to digital PCR and you'll get it working pretty well. So sometimes there might be a little optimization needed, sometimes not. But, you know, I would say, of course, there's a couple of technical details that are important. So um, the QX200 is a two-color instrument. So you have channel one for FAM-labeled probes, channel two for HEX or VIC-labeled probes. 
know, otherwise we have evergreen chemistry that's compatible with primers alone. But you know, aside from that, you, if you have an assay, you can use it. Um, that said, we do have a fantastic catalog of assays. So for example, wet lab validated mutation detection assays, gene expression copy number, even um, a CAR-T assay and some AAV related quantification assays. So you might wanna give those a shot, um, but, um, but yeah, we're not restricting you to just those. Yeah, so the, the only thing I'll add is because in some cases I've had customers when they talk about their assay, it's an all-in-one mix. So it has the DNA polymerase from the other vendor along with the assay itself. So the key thing to know is that, yes, the assays, and when we define assays as primers and probes, as Tara said, you can move over to DDPCR. Um, what is not compatible would be other vendors' uh, supermix or master mix, depending on how they label that. And that's just because our supermix for DDPCR is designed to create these emulsions, these droplets. So you have to make sure that you just substitute that component out um, from the other vendor. And if I could just follow up one more time, um, another question that I get sometimes is, I'm new to genomics. Tell me what to do. I don't even have an assay. Um, if we have an off-the-shelf assay, then that's immediately an answer. But we also have a dynamic design engine. So um, if you have a cosmic ID or if you just have a sequence that you want to be able to detect, you can go to online to our website and our DDPCR design engine can design one for you. And I've tested many, many assays that came off of that engine and they all work fantastic. So it's a really great resource. Well, I guess Diana's probably really happy to hear that they worked because... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we spent a lot of time making sure that we wet lab validated the design engines and the and the TM parameters. And that's one of the really nice things is if you design an assay using our design engines, it's compatible with the, the super mix and the system and the thermal cycling <clears throat> conditions that we recommend. And so you often wouldn't even want to, you know, or need to have to do like an, a temperature gradient or any kind of optimization. It should just work right out of the box for you. It's really nice. Fantastic. Yeah. All right, folks, I'm going to move us along. Let me find another question. <laughs> Ooh, here we go. Here's a good one. This is testing your knowledge. Are there FDA approved products that use DDPCR for QC? Yeah, I, I can okay. take that. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I'm a field application scientist and supporting biotech and biopharma uh, on the West Coast. Um, and so the short answer is yes. Um, obviously, we, we work with many customers that are developing specifically gene therapies that utilize DDPCR for determining titer um, for AAV. And a lot of that goes back to you know the, the host of literature that shows that DDPCR is really the method for getting accurate quantification um, of AAV titer. Um, one that uh, you know is publicly available and you can look up based on their BLA filing would be uh, Zolgensma from Avexis. So if that's something that you're interested just to see that filing, you can look that up and it is publicly found. Can you just say that drug one more time? The name of it? Zolgensma. <laughs> Bless you. <laughs> <laughs> I just love all the names of all the drugs that are coming out these days, right? We had aspirin when we were growing up and now they have these very convoluted names, all the different <laughs> monoclonal antibodies, something doodlemab. Um, it's really hard to say. So I take yeah. my virtual hat off to you, Matt, this morning. That's uh... <laughs> It is early on the West Coast. That's hardcore. All right. So um, keep those questions coming in. Audience, just type those into the little Q&A um, in your console there, and we'll keep asking the panelists. Um, as I said, we're looking for super hard questions this morning. I mean, <clears throat> not too hard questions this morning. <laughs> Um, otherwise, uh, they'll be ringing my neck later. All right, here we go. So let's see who else has here. Oh, here we go. So this, I guess this person already is a user of the technology. Why, do, why does this person see a difference in the number of droplets from well to well? Um, and what is the impact on my data? So, so I can take that one, and, it, and it's a, pr a pretty common question. So just to put a little bit of background, you know, when we are talking about droplet digital PCR, um, for those that aren't familiar, you are preparing a, 
basically think of a qPCR reaction, um, and then we are dropletizing that using a droplet generator. Um, and so when we generate these droplets, they are either done on typically like a manual system or we have our more automated QX200 and QX1 systems. So typically when customers ask me about differences in droplets from well to well, it's typically on the more manual systems, which, you know, things like pipetting. Obviously, it's always back to us as the user that typically causes the um the differences in droplet counts. Um, typically, it's caused by um, possibly pipetting air into the well with the manual systems. Um, but more common is you'll see differential droplet amounts based on the matrix, right? Samples have impact on the emulsions that are created, so different matrices can cause higher or lower droplet counts. So what I tell folks typically is that, you know, it can vary. The key thing is that we're creating a, a successful number of droplets. So we define in our software, typically it's 10,000 droplets or higher. Um, we would call a successful well a well. But it really depends on, am I looking for something rare or am I doing something like copy number, right? So copy number, we're talking about changes one versus two copies in a cell. And so those don't require a lot of partitions. But if you're doing something with like rare event detection, well then yes, we are a little more concerned about partitioning. And so what you can do is take a sample and pipette it across multiple wells and do something we call a, a meta well. So we can actually merge the data from two wells back together to then successfully get a higher droplet count. Ooh, I like that. Meta wells. <laughs> Ooh, that's like existential. Oh, Diana wants to add. Go ahead. <laughs> All right, I, I can I can add to that and just say that we do actually um, when we are flowing the the droplets past the detector, um, there are some quality metrics that can cause some of the droplets to be rejected if they're too close together or if they're the wrong size. So there are sometimes you know things that can happen during the microfluidic um, process that would make us say you know we don't want to use that droplet and that's just like a quality control um, uh, component. And it shouldn't affect your data, really, unless even if you have, in many cases, you can see below 10,000 droplets. And if you have replicate wells, you can see that it. the big difference is the error bar and not necessarily the data. Um, but yeah. under 10,000, we do flag it so that you can look at that well and just make sure nothing catastrophic happened. Good point. Brilliant. All right. So it's a little bit of uh, people error, a little bit of just science. Yeah, so, you know, with all, yeah. yeah, with any microfluidic device, you're going to have dead volume, and um, you know, I think we do a really good job of minimizing that. And so, most mm -hmm. um, microfluidic devices have a much, much larger uh, dead volume. So I think you know, it's something to, to keep in mind, especially like mm -hmm. what Matt said, if you have a rare target, you really don't want, you know, large, you know, like 90% dead volume, things like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we, we do minimize that. That's we cool. worked hard to, to <laughs> minimize that. <laughs> yeah, Diana's worked very hard. Yeah, very Diana hard. did, yeah. <laughs> All righty, so here comes another one. Uh, so, is it 21 CFR part 11 compliant for GXP assays? Does this cost a lot more from a research software version? So I'm guessing this is around um, regulatory uh, labs using the technology. Who wants this one? Sure, I, I can take this one and then uh, feel free to follow up. So uh, the short answer is we do have a 21 CFR compliant version of the software. Um, for those that have been using the QX200 for a while now, so our folks that have been using it since 2013, let's say, um, there's a new version. So there's a new software on the block. And I have to say that I'm quite excited about it because it incorporates a lot of the features that especially those folks in QAQC had requested. Um, so those are things like automatic data archiving, having redundant server locations for data files, as well as requiring user logins that require domain login and credentials. Um, and so a lot of those features were based off the need of these groups that we incorporated. Um, and of course, what we did is based on your specific group. So it, at your company, if you have different um, 
credential or not credentials, but you have different requirements for different users. So let's say my analysts, I want them to be able to run protocols, but I don't want them to be able to change, you know, the, the reading um, protocol that I created. I just want them to run it. Well, we can set those credentials for the analysts versus maybe the, the manager. You just want them to be able to send out reports. So they only have reporting uh, privileges. So you can customize it based on what your needs are. But obviously it's a compliant version of the software. So you would need to work with your IT to make it fully compliant as required by 21 CFR. That's brilliant. Thank you, Matt. All right, let's get us along to another one. And I like how they've prefaced this technical question. <laughs> my, right? My, just get your brains going, right? My QX200 manual DG only generates between eight to 12,000 droplets. Could you advise on how to improve droplet generation so that we can quantify at higher concentrations? All right. Who wants this one? Yeah, so I can, I can take that one. Um, yeah. yeah. So, uh, right. So there would be more questions than I can give you answers straight off the block. <laughs> but some things that you should look at. So um, I guess first would be, are any of your reagents expired? Because um, if things like your supermix, or your droplet generation oil are expired, then that could of course negatively affect the results. Um, in that range that you are looking at, um, a sem semi-common thing that people are doing in that case would be um, look at the order of your workflow. So is there any chance that you were pipetting the oil into the cartridge before the sample? Because um, the if you've, you've probably noticed, if you've ever looked at the droplet generation oil, it has a very low surface tension. And so if you put it in the cartridge first, it can flood the cartridge and make it difficult for your sample to make its way in. What we recommend, what, you know, what our rule actually is that you have to put your sample into the cartridge, droplet generation cartridge first, and then you put in your droplet generation oil and you'll get much higher droplet counts that way. Um, you know, another couple other things, you know, check the brand of pipette tips. You know, so based on your droplet counts, I kind of doubt that this is the issue, but we do recommend Rainin and Eppendorf pipette tips above some of the other brands out there. And just also just check, you know, one other question I'd ask is, is this a new thing? Did you used to get more droplets and now you've decrease to this range that you're 8,000 to 12,000, or have you always gotten 8,000, 12,000? If it's always been that way, um, you might check, are your samples at room temperature and in your sample um, purification process, are there, um, are there chemicals coming along, you know, that are inhibiting your droplet formation? So for example, ethanol is a common one. If people don't fully dry out their spin columns, it can elute ethanol into your sample, which isn't so great for droplets. So. Sorry, I couldn't give you a quick response on that. There's a couple of different things it could be, but um, yeah, that's some stuff to think about. Yeah, yeah there's a lot to go into uh, to make these little droplets. So uh, there's more than I figured there. <laughs> <laughs> Diana? <laughs> yeah, and I'd just add one other thing that we, we often um, need to emphasize, which is, um, you know, proper vortexing of all the reagents mm -hmm. prior to making your, your supermix, um, as well as after you've added all the components, including the sample. Making sure that things are mixed well is really critical for making good, um, proper sized droplets. Yeah. yeah, that was funny. In the before time, as I call it now, uh, 2019, we have an FAS in our team. He, he would always say that the best thing, the reason that our, we fly him around the entire country, the number one thing that we can tell you is vortex everything. Um, because unlike qPCR, where you can put the reagents in, you put it on the thermal block, well, the heating and cooling is going to mix the sample. But with Droplet Digital, right, we're going to be creating droplets first. So if you didn't mix thoroughly, some droplets are going to have a lot more components than others. And we, need, we rely on the fact that everything is evenly dispersed across the sample. So the, everybody Once gets... Once you have uh, droplets, though, don't mix anything anymore. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. ooh, 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 so ooh. what I tell people, mix everything more than you would think you would need to until you generate droplets. But once you have droplets, you're not mixing them. You're not centrifuging them. Great you're not yeah. passing go. You just put those onto the plate and the thermocycler and you're, you're fine. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. So great advice there from our panelists. So here is another technical 
question, is it normal to see two phases like an organic inorganic separation once a sample is partitioned? Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. Everybody says yes. <laughs> Unanimous. Okay. Does someone want to explain why maybe? <laughs> I think Diana had her hand up there. Sure, I can explain. Okay. So the um, the sample, the, the phase at the top of the well that you're looking at is actually uh, the droplets. They float on top of our, our oil. The oil is actually more dense than the, the supermix. So um, that's why you see that layer. Those are actually tiny little droplets that you're looking at. And it's also why we recommend a deep well block so that the temperature of the thermocycler reaches the, the top of the droplet pack. Um, in your uh, reaction. Well, oh, that makes sense. Brilliant. Uh, I'm going to steal that, actually. I really like that as an explanation. It's a like a two-phase separation. I'm going to use that in future trainings. <laughs> oh, nice. Well, kudos, <laughs> kudos to the uh, to the question question giver. Mm. Uh, questioner, questioner. I don't know. Uh, let's move on uh, before I make even more of a crazy fool of myself. Here we go. Here is a nice long one for everybody. Doo -doo -doo -doo. What is the limit of detection limit of quanti quanti I can't say quantification this morning of <laughs> WC DDPCR for a single 100 base pair target from your bulletin, a count of 4,000 cells in five microliters is recommended for detection of an edit frequency down to 0.1%. Oh, good Lord. Up to 60,000 cells per well can be used. I think I wrote that. that. <laughs> I think I wrote, wrote that. this technical um, note? Is that Diana? No, that would be me. Um, okay, good. Yeah, All right. So I, I can actually... <laughs> I can speak to that. So often when we get the question about, you know, what's the, you know, dynamic range or limit of detection, limit of quantification, um, it really is, it does depend on what sensitivity you're looking for, right? If you have, you know, a 50% of your, you know, cells should have your target, then, you know, obviously, you know, you have a very lar large dynamic range, but you, if you want to look for something that's very rare, then you need to add more um, cells to that well. And so our, DDPCR whole cell workflow is very similar in dynamic range to our um, D DNA inputs. So it's very, very similar. It's just that um, for the, the case where you're looking for, um, you know, maybe less rare things, you can add fewer cells, which is often a benefit for this protocol. Got it. Yeah, just doing sense. a little back of the math, back of the envelope calculation, and I'm going to embarrass myself if I get it wrong, but if we're talking about 0.1% in 20,000 cells, that gets us down to 20 cells, right? Right. Um, so if you if you load much less than 20,000 cells, but you really want to get 0.1%, suddenly you're talking about only detecting just a couple of cells in, in your, you know, positive, you know, signal. So that's not a lot. And so um, it would, of course, depend on what your, the limit of your blank looks like, what your you know, template controls look like, et cetera. But a lot of people will feel better if they detect 20 positive cells than if they detect three yeah. positive cells. So you can't expect a certain level, if, for example, 0.1% um, sensitivity if you're only running a very small amount of sample. Right. Very nice explanation, Tara. Yep. Good, good math. <laughs> <laughs> I was on a another coffee chat and we ended up we were talking about statistics and physics mm -mm. and flow and oh goodness it got very technical for such an early time in the morning okay here's a nice easy one um so this person's curious how many samples they can run in a day I mean, I guess it depends how long the day is right and whether you're uh, an undergrad or a postgrad or the PI right yeah, sure, yeah. <laughs> i can take that oh, one okay yeah, so, as laura was saying it does depend on a lot of variables it depends what kind of system you have in your lab and yeah how hard you're working um so like um so we we work in 96 well plates you know so first of all so in one given run um you can run up to 96 samples on a plate 
um, the full workflow. And of course, this will also vary depending on what type of application you're doing, but it's about five hours from start to finish. But you can, um, it's, you can layer them on top of each other. Um, so basically, you can get one plate in the thermocycler and go back to the you know step number one and start preparing some more samples. Um, so even uh, labs that have only one system and one very busy technician can get about four plates done in a day. So we're talking about 400 samples there, a little less. But yeah, basically 400 samples. Then, of course, if you have... Um, um, multiple thermocyclers, multiple readers, that can help you increase your workflow even more than that. Um, I should add that our newer system, the QX1, is a all-in-one platform where instead of having a separate droplet generator, thermocycler, and reader, you just put your, your samples in the GCR96 um, plate format into the little hotel that um, handles the plates and it'll take up to five plates and just hold them until the machine's ready for them and send them right through the workflow. So in that way you can get five plates done, you know, load them up in a shift and just queue them up and they're ready to go. Yeah. Yeah. I'll say, yeah, the, the QX one, which came out late last year, early this year has definitely in biopharma biotech, especially us that work with manufacturing groups, KQC groups have kept us really busy um, because folks are really interested in the automation. Um, one thing we talked about earlier was 21 CFR compliance. And, you know, when we think about the traditional workflow where we have a droplet generator and then we have a thermal cycler and a reader, you know, there's, there's breaks in the workflow there where analysts have to interact uh, versus the QX1 where it's all built in one system, all of that gets tracked with the protocol. So not only are you creating plate layouts and, um, and thermal cycling protocols together, but also it tracks the droplet generation. And if there was any low droplet counts, all that gets tracked in the audit trail. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think it's a matter of what level of throughput you need. And we've really put in a lot of time, uh, Diana's team's put in a lot of time in thinking of how we can address based on your workflow um, and based on your throughput, which instrument's best for you. No, something else I should add, um, sticking up for the people that I talk to more often as well, is we've been kind of pushing the upper bounds of workflow in our answer so far, but it's also, yeah. you can run a lot fewer samples too. So you can run eight samples for one droplet generation cartridge and that's it. And in that case, you're not, you know, quote unquote, wasting the consumables for the rest of a 96 well plate. So it's a very flexible system in terms of how many samples you run. Fantastic. Yeah, and I, I, I can add to that to just be more specific to the whole cell DDPCR workflow, which um, right now uh, is not um, compatible with an auto DG, so it needs the manual DG nor the QX1, although the, the others may be coming soon. Um, but the first version of this protocol is just for the manual droplet generator. Um, and in that situation, it's very easy to run um, a 96 well plate in about uh, five hours. But if you only want to run, say, a few samples, then it could be as you know short as um, three or four hours to get an answer. So it just depends on the number of samples. Uh, it takes about two hours to, to read a full plate. Perfect. And I just want to go back and figure out who came up with the name Plate Hotel. Why do plates get a hotel, right? Do you have a shoe hotel, car hotel, a plate hotel, <laughs> right? Plate park, car park, plate park. Is it a four-star hotel, a five-star hotel? Okay, stop me now. Stop me now. Somebody <laughs> send me a question. Please stop this stand-up comedy. Okay, here we go. Uh, okay, so this person is asking, after plate reading, they saw some wells had more liquid remaining than the others. I think that this will be reducing the droplet counts. Is that true? Is there anything I can do to ensure that the maximum sample volume is read across all wells? Hmm. Great question. I, I can actually answer that. Okay. So, I mean, I think that um, the first thing that you want to do is you want to make sure that you have the most recent version of our software um, because early versions of the Quantisoft software um, was programmed to leave a little bit behind in the well. Just, uh, uh, you know, the, the latest versions are more robust in making sure that all of the liquid is, is um, 
aspirated out of the well and red. So that would be my first thought because I don't, we don't typically see um, a lot of uh, sample volume left over in the well. The other thing yeah. would be that just making sure that you're adding the proper um, volumes to your uh chips if you're using the manual system make sure that you're only pipetting 70 microliters of the oil and only 20 microliters of your sample if you're adding more than that then you likely have too much um, sample in your in your well and it's not going to all be red all right yeah it would be a good idea to head. check the plate do a nice little side check of what the samples look like from the side before you put it in the reader and see if you see any that are starting off higher than the others, and then you can troubleshoot that. Yeah. yeah and the only other thing I can think of is make sure you're using a DDPCR plate. Um, I, there may be an instance where you, if it's been switched to some other plate, it could have a slightly different depth, but that's the, about the only other thing I can think of that would cause uh, liquid loss. Yeah, leftover. true story. I was just in a lab an actual, I was in the lab personally. <laughs> it doesn't happen a lot these days, but they were getting very, very few droplets. And I'm like, what's going on? And then I take a look around and I see there's this box of plates that is um, similar looking to our droplet digital PCR plates, but they were unskirted plates. So they were sitting too low. The reader wasn't, was only picking up the very little bitty top of the reaction. And so they were having low droplet counts. So the plate does matter. Which is why they get their own hotel, right? I mean, you know. Correct. Circling back. Circling back. Okay. <laughs> All right. Let uh, keep going. That one just <clears throat> did not go down well. Okay. I'm getting a. So this person's getting different quantification for their reference standard from what they expected. Why is that? I can take that one. Um, although it's something that Matt kind of already touched on, so I'm just going to piggyback off of his answer, maybe just take it wholesale. Um, the question is, where did you get the reference standard and how is it quantified, right? So um, we like to think that a reference standard is so the so-called true or accurate answer, but depending on how it was quantified in the first place, it might not be entirely accurate or maybe the quantification was um, had a fair amount of error um, associated with it that isn't necessarily always represented on the product sheet. Um, also, some methods of quantification are just actually measuring things in a completely different way. So for example, um, <clears throat> when I do AAV trainings, so AAV titering, a type of control that's often used is a, um, a virus that was quantified with a TCID50 assay. And so that's looking at infectivity Whereas in DDPCR, we're looking at genomes, right? So those are somewhat related, but not necessarily exactly the same. So it could be a source yeah. of um, difference. Yeah, the other thing I'll say is if I, I've come in, in contact with it a few times, and I think uh, Tara and I's colleague, Steve Katsopoulos, has, has spoke about this in the past, that if you're utilizing like a G block as your, your kind of standard, just kind of testing your assay, make sure that if you're doing any dilutions of that, that you're putting some type of carrier in there because it is uh, it has a tendency to stick to stuff, right? So if you're doing a dilution, you may get a lower quant because it's sticking to the edges of the tube. So put some type of carrier in there just to make sure that it stays in solution. Yeah, also G blocks are great as positive controls, but they're terrible quantitative controls. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I can add to that too and say that, you know, what we see is a lot of um, qPCR assays use a, a plasmid as a, as a yeah. standard curve. And um, sometimes those plasmids aren't um, purified very well. And it sometimes helps to run them through a second column just to get better um, measurements. So if you're using an OD system where you're using um, a nano drop um, in order to quantify, that can really impact the quantitation of your um, plasmid, it's generally not going to be that comparable to an actual um, quantitative measurement like DDPCR, but you can get a lot closer if you have a much better purified sample. So those are some of the things that we see that really can have a large impact in a standard curve really not matching um, the expected. Well, and how long has your standard or control been sitting around too? Yeah. 
for so freeze thaw. It's not going to amplify. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Freeze thaw. Um, also plasmids tend to, to uh, hypercoil without being um, restriction enzyme digested. All of those things can really impact your PCR. Yeah, and just to piggyback on that, because that question comes up a lot, and I am always an advocate of aliquoting out what you're going to use for a particular run. So if for a particular run for you is half a plate, aliquot out those components so that you're not going through those freeze-thaw cycles. As we're all aware, uh, DNA polymerase proteins do not like freeze-thaws, right? It's not going to make that a stable structure. So, um, and the same thing for DNA or RNA. So try to aliquot things out and, and um, anticipate what your use is going to be just so you don't end up losing half a vial of supermix that would have been perfectly fine if it had been aliquoted. Yeah, and sort of the, the final thing that I'll say and comment to that is that the work that we've done around um, AAV, um, developing an AAV protocol from start to finish is that, you know, AAV um, genomes are uh, partially single-stranded, and um, that often can change the way that they look in a PCR reaction. So a plasmid um, isn't always going to look the same or give you the same results. So um, it, it, although if you absolutely have to use a plasmid as a reference standard, um, then of course that's that's what you need to do. But just realize that it's not, it doesn't represent an AAV viral genome very well. Yeah. And that's true of RNA as well. Like RNA and DNA um, are going to give you very different um, uh, quantities in uh, in the different measurements. Oh, great advice there. So then I think that this would be a great follow-up question. So judging from all of your <clears throat> conversations here, I'm guessing the answer is yes, but do we have a protocol for AAV viral titering? Yes. Uh, yeah. Sorry, I'm excited because that's the majority of the things I do is around uh, viral titering these days. So um, uh, Diana, in fact, and she can probably go into more detail, has done a lot of work uh, optimizing uh, AAV protocol for droplet digital PCR. There's been a lot of optimization that's been done um, in the research community. So obviously, you can look back at the lock papers from 2014. There's a paper by Dobnik 2019, which does a little more optimization. Um, but we do have a protocol that should be coming out in the near future. Um, but with that said, if it's something that you uh, have interest in, you can reach out to your sales rep and, and your FAS, and we can um, go through that with you and provide it to you. Yeah, it's actually... Um also comes with some assays that we have made available as well for the ITR and GFP and some other universal assays for the AAV um, uh, viral titering protocol. So you can repeat our results um, with those assays if, if desired. Oh, that's brilliant. The controls baked in. Love it. All right, uh, so we're almost going to be running out of time soon. So I'm going to try and get through these last couple of questions. OK, so here's another uh, instrument question. <laughs> Can this person reuse a DGB gasket? Uh, they're saying that they look like new after petitioning. <laughs> What's the best advice here? Looking at Tara. I feel like Tara can. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I guess who knows I have customers that have asked me this question before. Uh -oh. <laughs> uh, we do not recommend reusing any of the consumables. And I, I know that sounds like a bummer. Um, it sometimes looks new, but sometimes um, it can have a little bit of splashing, you know, on the, on the underside. That's why it's there. Um, a part of why it's there. So for anyone who's um, relatively new for DDP to DDPCR, so when we're preparing our reactions, we have a droplet generation cartridge which goes into a purpose-built holder. You load it with your sample, your droplet generation oil, and um, a little orange gasket made out of rubber or something along those lines goes over the top. And so that helps make the connection, the seal between the droplet generation cartridge and the droplet generator, you know, inside. And... Um, most of the time, you know, a lot of time when you take it off, it looks like it's perfectly clean. Um, but it's, it, yeah, do you want to, do you want to bank your entire experiment on it? <laughs> so it could, um, it could, could contaminate, you know, future wells. Um, we just really, 
I, I personally wouldn't want to take that risk. You know, um, you don't want to risk your samples. You don't want to risk your time. Um, I just really wouldn't recommend it. And that goes for the droplet generation cartridge too, of course. You don't want to reuse your plates and your seals. Um, they are meant to be single use consumables because you want the best results every time. Yeah, and, and I'll add to that and just say that the gaskets can, even a small amount of stretching on the gaskets can impact, um, it could cause a, a DGA to fail. Um, so I don't think um, most of the time we don't want to, you know, risk our samples like that. So yeah, probably better to just get fresh gaskets. <clears throat> All right, fresh gaskets for everybody. Okay, here we go. <laughs> All right. Oh, here's a good one. All right. So I guess this person still needs to be convinced. What is the benefit of using Droplet Digital over QPCR? Apart from the fact that you get to use gaskets or gaskets. Do we call them gaskets in England? I don't know. Gaskets, gaskets. I don't know. Anyway, Tara, you were going <laughs> to take it. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I support both. So I think that there are a lot of advantages to both. In fact, I made a 15 minute presentation about it. So let me queue up those slides. Um, but no, uh, I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll skip the slides this time. <laughs> um, so the benefit, you know, so um, with digital PCR, you are getting absolute quantification without having to run standard curves. And so that may not sound like a lot when you just hear the words, but when you think about what it means, we just spent, you know, what was it, like a good five minutes with back and forth talking about all the limitations of using standards for determining, for standard curves for determining quantification. There are a lot of potential problems there, you know, and your accurate quantification is based on your accurate standard curve. So if you can just bypass that entirely and go straight to DDPCR that gives you absolute quantification, why not? Um, so for the, the all of the benefits um, will differ depending on which application you're doing. But if, if we are talking about cell and gene therapy, let's say AAV titering, aside from that ab um, absolute quantification, it's also extremely precise in its measurements. So I've seen some papers that talk about the, the great quantification they get with their qPCR, always less than 30% CV. I mean, that's great, right? Whereas in DDPCR, we're talking about usually more like 2%, kind of in that ballpark. So um, if you not only want you know, the accurate absolute quantification, but you also want a high degree of precision in your answer, then DDPCR is a great option for that. All right. I guess oh, uh, the, the one last thing I'll add is um, it's especially useful when it comes to moving between laboratories. So if anyone has ever been involved in transitioning a qPCR assay, even from one lab across the hall to the other, right? Um, but, you know, even worse if it's going to a, a CDMO or something like that, you know, the amount of user bias that can accidentally be introduced is much more substantial with qPCR, right? You know, again, how did we accurately quantify those standards? Uh, was there any effect in the dilution series? Was it a linear dilution series? And then, you know, just the, the mechanism of qPCR is we're looking at efficiency, right? So qPCR is a measure of efficiency of a reaction related to a standard. So any component that could affect that efficiency is going to have an effect on your quantification. DDPCR is fundamentally different that its endpoint, where we're only asking how many droplets contain the target template. And so we don't have that bias based on slight differences in the sample makeup causing a change in efficiency. Yeah, also just to follow up, you know, one more time from the perspective of someone who teaches people how to do qPCR and DDPCR on a regular basis, I personally think that DDPCR is easier. So a lot Agreed. of people assume that the newest technology is the hardest technology to learn, but I would say it's the opposite. Um, whether you are an undergraduate or a postdoc or, hey, even a PI who maybe hasn't been in the lab for a little while, <laughs> um, you know, we can get you to get in good results usually by the end of a five-hour training. Um, with QPCR, you'll get results by the end of a training. Um, it's often harder to get 
what we would call good results. Um, there's more yeah. controls involved. There's more very fine process techniques that need to be learned. Uh, whereas in DDPCR, the lack of reliance upon amplification efficiency, et cetera, means you can bypass a lot of that. Yeah, and, and I'll add one one final comment to that, which is, you know, for cases especially where you actually need to know the true quantity of a product, like with AAV, um, because you're actually treating patients with that number, um, that really becomes critical. I think um, having a relative measurement just doesn't make sense anymore, and I think that's why a lot of um, uh, gene therapy companies are moving to DDPCR because they need a real number um, and not just a you know a relative uh, number. All right. Um, I okay. I'll do one more for everybody here. Let's see. Make it a softball. Oh. <laughs> uh oh. Oh, you're saying cut it? No. 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 Just kidding. One more, make you work. <laughs> so for a DDPCR run, do you recommend setting a single manual threshold for all samples or different thresholds for each? I could take that. All right. <laughs> so um, this sometimes depends on the number of samples that you have. Um, you'll see that often um, it is easiest to just set a threshold across multiple wells that have been all selected um, and setting a single threshold. But sometimes if you have a full 96 well plate, it just starts to look really crowded and difficult to set a threshold. And so in those cases, I would recommend setting an individual threshold. But just knowing your assay um, as well as knowing the way that you're running that, um, it's best to you know decide uh, for yourself, how to set that that um, manual threshold? Brilliant. Yeah, something I'd add is you know so first of all, yeah, you know, for a given primer and probe set or multiplex, the <clears throat> the negative droplet fluorescence should be pretty reproducible. And so if for the, the same probes, if you know one well has a negative droplet fluorescence around 1,000, pretty much all of them should be around 1,000. So that's what um, enables us to set a single threshold across many different wells is because that baseline doesn't usually change very much. Um, that said, if you're running two different sets of assays on a plate, of course, you're going to need to set two separate thresholds for the different you know, assays. Um, and if you are running evergreen, that baseline can change around, so it gets relatively difficult to set a single threshold. Um, now, the great thing about digital, one of the things I love so much is that it's a, you know, it is a digital reaction. You've got negative droplets and you have positive droplets. And whatever threshold you set shouldn't matter that much because in a well-optimized assay, you shouldn't have all that many droplets, or what we call rainy droplets in between. So a lot of people get very caught up in where they set thresholds. But again, you know, really you're just setting which droplets are negative versus positive. So again, with a real optimized assay, where you put your threshold shouldn't matter a great deal. Fantastic. And I think if no one has anything to add, I'm gonna close us out for this coffee chat. Um, sorry for the uh, folks who still have questions waiting to be answered. We will get those responses to you through email. Uh, thank you so much to our great panelists today. It was great to have you join us, Diana. And thanks again, Matt and Tara. That was awesome. Thank you. As they say in America. <laughs> and let me give a super quick plug to some of the other coffee chats. If you enjoyed listening to us today, you know, you can sign up and listen to some more. There's all sorts of different topics around cell sorting, cell analysis, qPCR, um, so yeah, just uh, take a look, use the, the link there that, that we're showing and you can get more details for the different types of technologies that our team can uh, support you with. All right, so with that, I'm gonna say goodbye, everybody. Um, hang tight, stay safe and uh, be well and we'll see you at another coffee chat. Take care, everybody. Bye for now. Thank you. Bye. Bye.